We're talking about the glory of the Lord. Oh, I wish. I wish somehow I could share with you in such a way that you would feel and see and recognize the glory of the Lord. I don't. I know there's so much more, so much more than we have experienced of his glory and his presence. The book of Isaiah, chapter 44, it's, a, it's an amazing chapter. It really has to do a great deal with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah, chapter 44, I want to begin with verse 8. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. The world needs to see the glory of God, and Israel was God's witness to the world. But today, Jesus says, you are my witnesses to the church. So not only does Israel witness to the greatness and the glory of God, but the church, the believers, are a constant witness <clears throat> to the glory of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, will you open this to our hearts that we might see and understand what the Spirit of God would say to us about the glory of the Lord. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The rest of verse 8 says this, Is there a God beside me? Question. God is ask, asking this question. Is there another God? Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. He is the rock of ages. He is the rock that followed them in the wilderness. There are those who say that Israel has a tradition that when they arrived at the next destination on their journey through the wilderness, that they looked and the rock had followed them. They say that when Paul mentions this in the book of 1 Corinthians, that he is probably alluding to that tradition that the rock followed them. I don't buy that. I believe the rock followed them in the wilderness. I believe that when they arrived at the new destination, that there was something about that rock that was there. Doesn't that rock look familiar to the one we saw at the last camp? And I believe the children ran to the rock and climbed on that rock and made it a great play place for them. And I believe there were those who became very religious and said, children... Don't play with the rock. But the rock was Christ. And the children were sometimes rebuked for coming and sitting on the lap of Jesus. But Jesus strongly scolded those and says, do not forbid the children to come. In fact, unless your heart becomes like the heart of a child, you can in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. The rock that was there. Think about that rock. Think about what it was like as they come weary from the journey. The God who has been leading them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night certainly can move a rock from one camp to the other. In fact, when God talks about the rock, he doesn't describe it. He doesn't say, now I want you to go over and find a rock. And when you find that rock, that's the one I want you to smite, to, to hit. No, he says, go to the rock. In all cases in the word, Israel recognizes the rock. They don't recognize the significance of it, but they recognize the rock. As I was reading this week, I came across something that really 
moved my heart. It says this in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. The Lord says, I will stand before you there on the rock, and you shall strike the rock. The only way that I can imagine this happening, as others have described it, is that when God spoke to Moses and they needed water, The herds needed water. The people needed water. They want to stone Moses because Moses is not providing for them. It it took, let me tell you, it took a long time for the Israelites to ever learn that Moses wasn't the provider. How many of you know God is the provider? It was then the case, it is now the case. The church isn't the provider. The individuals aren't the provider. God's the provider. And when we keep that before our eyes, we need to have no fear. In fact, the word starts there that we read, don't be afraid. You are my witnesses. What are they to witness to? That my God shall supply what? All of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Notice that when they needed water, Moses was told, you're not the water. The water is in the rock. Does that make sense? The water is in the rock. I don't know how many times you've broken a rock open. I've never seen a drop of water in a rock, have you? There is no water in a rock. And yet, this glorious truth that the Word says would be an example to us is Out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Where did that come from? It came from the rock. It came from the rock. And God says to Moses, I want you to go over to the rock, take your rod, and when you get to the rock, I want you to smite that rock. I want you to hit that rock as hard as you can hit it. That's not a problem. You can take a rod and hit a rock, and the rock feels nothing. But Moses, before you hit the rock, my glory is going to descend upon it. My glory is going to come and settle upon that rock. And when you hit the rock, you're hitting me. You're hitting my glory. I don't know about you, That caused me great hesitation. How? How, Lord, do I strike the glory of God? How do I smite the glory of God? But Moses had to do it. I don't think even Moses had yet understood the significance of the rock. That will be revealed later on but he understood the significance of the glory. He knew what the glory was. He had been on the mountain. He had come down with the glory so shining from his face that the people said, cover your face. We can't look upon that glory. And now he is asked, smite the glory. Smite the glory. You shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses takes the elders of the people, gathers the people around, and he says, water is coming. He pulls back his rod, and he strikes through the glory to the rock, and water comes gushing out of the rock, and the people are fed. Flocks, the herds, they all have plenty to drink. Can you imagine what that geyser was like? I mean, we're talking flocks and a 
crowd of people that are estimated to be around 2 million. Can you imagine what that was like? In Belfont, Pennsylvania, there is a great spring there. It's a spring, I suppose, about the size of the sound room that just constantly flows. It's a great spring. There's, if you go from there back towards Hublersburg, where our home was, there's no water any place till you get almost to Hecla before a stream is there. All through that next mile, so there's nothing, but it all's running un- underground, and it comes out of this wonderful spring of water. It must have been a spring like that coming out of the rock, four foot deep, 12 foot wide, and it watered everything. The children of Israel are forgetful. How many of you know we're forgetful? We've seen the rock provide, but we forget it. And when all of a sudden our need arises again, rather than turning to the rock that followed them in the wilderness, that rock was Christ. We look for other areas to turn. And so I ask you today, when the rock is Christ, can you come to him and say, Lord, you are my everything. You are my all in all. I need nothing but you, you will supply all that I need. And we go to him and say, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. Fill me, Lord. But the people forget. And the herds are lowing for water and buying and all of the sounds that they make. The people begin to grumble and complain and say, we need water, we need water. And God speaks to Moses. See, they still think Moses is the provider. Get it through our heads. My God, my God, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There's a blind man sitting beside the road. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, Pastor Andy could have said to that blind man, what do you want me to do? He would have been limited. He could have said to me, what do you want me to do? I would have been very limited. But when you say to Jesus and Jesus says to you, what do you want me to do? It's unlimited. There are no limits whatsoever. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing God. And so God says to Moses, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. You and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together and speak to the rock. Very specific. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Moses is frustrated. Moses is saying, what's wrong with you people? Don't you understand yet what God can do? You saw it before. And he takes his rod that God told him to take. And he takes Aaron. And he goes to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock. Must we bring water for you out of the rock? And the water came out. Despite his disobedience, the water came out. The people were fed. There was water for everyone. The flocks drank. The spring ran full and rich. 
But God was displeased. God said, because you did not sanctify me before the people. If you had spoken to the rock. You see, they think it's somehow in there and all you have to do is break the rock and the water will come out. But if you'd have spoken to the people, if you'd have said, spring forth, O well, the water would have burst forth and the people would have said, that's God, that's God. I can witness to it, that's God. Can I tell you that as God's children, Sometimes we fail to understand who he is. We fail to understand that he's the rock. That he's able to do anything and everything. And instead of giving this opportunity, we do what Israel did, set up idols. I mean, you know that Israel was constantly setting up idols. The Lord had said, you are my witnesses, and instead of really being, oh, we'll make a golden calf, and we'll fall down before it, and we'll worship it. The Lord mocks idolatry. It took 70 years of Israel being out of the land and being a captive under Nebuchadnezzar and the other kings before they ever got the idolatry thing dealt with. Listen to what the Lord says. Verse 14. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he shall take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With the half he eats meat, he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest he makes into a god, a carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. You ever stop to think the foolishness of idolatry? The guy cuts down the tree, saws it to the size he wants, then saws the rest of it up for firewood. He gets the rest of it all sawed up for firewood, and he begins to image in his mind what he's going to carve out of this. And while he's doing it, His wife says, I need fire to bake bread and to roast your meat. Oh, take that. That wood right there. It'll do fine. Wait a minute. Isn't that your God? Oh, no, no. That's just firewood. And so she takes the wood and she builds the fire and she roasts it. And he's out there carving away on the piece that's left and trying to form it into the form of a man. And and she says, honey, come on in. Dinner's ready. And he walks in the house, and, and the firewood that he's making a god out of is now just wood. And he co- pulls up to the fire, and he says, oh, it's chilly out there. Ah, I've seen the fire. Ah, I've seen the fire. And then he goes back and carves the wood. And he gets the wood all made, and it's an ma- image of a man. And he sets it up, and he falls down, and he says, you are my god. How foolish. And Israel, who is the witness to the greatness and power of God, falls for this satanic abomination and falls down before a piece of wood or gold formed in the image of a calf and worships and says, you are my God. You brought me out of Egypt. How foolish. And yet how foolish we are when instead of turning to the Lord, we turn to whatever else we can turn to and say, you are my God. 
The Lord says, you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other God. There is no other rock. I know not one. Stop and ask yourself the question. How close do I live to the King of kings and Lord of lords? How much do I understand of who he is? How often do I allow him to prove himself to me? How often do I fall before him and say, I just want to worship you, Jesus. I just want to love you. And we find that he is always, always what he says he will be. Ah, but let me tell you, even though he is always what he said he would be, even though he is always God of very God, even though he is always King of kings and Lord of lords, he will allow your faith to be tested by withdrawing himself, the consciousness of his presence. How many of you have been there? He withdraws the consciousness of his presence to see, will you follow me because I have spoken and my word is truth, or do you have to have evidence all the time? Or is your very witness your evidence? The very fact that you look back and say, my God has supplied all of my need. The very fact that you look back and say, one day I confessed my sin and he cleansed me and he purified me and the blood of Jesus took away my sin. Is that your evidence? Is that your evidence? You see, the rock, which is Christ, is revealed by the glory of his presence. And once we have seen the glory of his presence, we should be able, by his power and his grace, to walk in faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. They that come to him must believe even when they cannot see. They must believe even when their throat is dry. They must say, Lord, I need water, and I look no place else but to you because you are the spiritual fountain of living water for me. Let me close with this. The world is terrified today. I have a little thing that I wrote the other day on my desk. What happens to a nation that is so afraid of dying that it refuses to live? And that's not just America today. That is literally worldwide. Nations that are so terrified of death that they refuse to live. They refuse to say, my God is alive. And if my God is alive, even if I die, I go to be with him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, that we could rise up as a church and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If we could just come to that place in our lives where we would say so clearly to the Lord, Lord, I believe you. I believe you. I trust you. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have all of the promises. All of the promises. Someone said, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? Every hand but one went up. And the man said, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, yes, but I thought you were getting a load to go right now. (laughs) Fear. Fear is the enemy of faith. Learn to trust God because he is the rock. He He has never failed anyone. My God 
my God, is able to meet every need. Open your heart, open your life, and say, Jesus, I trust in you.